Uh, good morning, happy new year, uh, happy year of the sheep. Uh, I'm Mike Green, Senior Vice President for Asia and Japan Chair here at CSIS. Um, thank you all for coming on what is probably the first uh, day of work for a lot of people, including I think most of us. <clears throat> um, tomorrow, um, Congress comes into session and we face a new world in Washington, um, a Republican Congress, um, a Democratic President, and uh, so far on issues from immigration to Cuba policy, um, there are uh, signs that the new Congress and the White House are going to be uh, colliding with each other politically and over policy. Um, what we wanted to do today and in the short report we've produced is spotlight one area uh, where uh, bipartisan cooperation, um, forming an agenda um, to move forward is not only possible but necessary, and that's in the area of policy towards the Asia-Pacific region, which in Washington, a very partisan town these days, is probably one of the most bipartisan areas of foreign policy, uh, unless it becomes corrupted by the disagreements over other areas. So we wanted in this report to try to spotlight um, issues um, and actions the administration and Congress can take together to keep moving forward what President Obama has called the pivot uh, and others call the rebalance. Um, a majority of Americans uh, in polls now consider uh, Asia to be the most important region in the world to U.S. interests. We've done surveys of elites in the U.S. and in Asia here at CSIS, and support for the rebalance to Asia has over 90 percent um, favorable uh, ratings uh, among American experts, which means a lot of Republicans uh, are behind the idea of focusing more on the Asia-Pacific as well. Our surveys also showed, however, that within the region, while there's pretty robust support for the rebalance outside of, of China, where there's more suspicion, there are real questions about whether it can be sustained. Uh, that showed up in our survey last spring, and you hear it um, increasingly uh, because of divided government in this town, uh, because the president is constrained uh, by budget sequestration and uh, pulled into crises from Ukraine to Iraq uh, and uh, Iran. So we think it's critical and practical that the White House and the leadership in the Congress uh, begin charting a common course on policy towards Asia. We've done a series of um, uh, nonpartisan, bipartisan dinners and roundtables um, as we thought about this agenda, and uh, it seems clear to us that there is a lot of room to move forward together. Um, the report outlines specific actions on China, uh, defense policy in Asia, uh, the Korean Peninsula, India, and Southeast Asia. Um, this was internally uh, funded and generated. We did it on our own uh, research budgets um, and drew on the um, Asia expertise we have here at CSIS, which uh, runs uh, the gamut in terms of regional functional expertise and policy background. Um, on my far left, uh, on your far right, you decide which, um, is our Freeman Chair, Chris Johnson. Uh, Scott Miller uh, leads our work on business diplomacy here at this, as the Skull Chair. Victor Cha is the Korea Chair. Um, Matt Goodman um, is the Simon Chair in International Political Economy. Uh, Bonnie Glazer is Senior Advisor on Asia and a fellow at the Freeman Chair on China. Uh, Rick Rosso, our Wadwani Chair on in India. And uh, Ernie Bauer, um, the Southeast Asia Chair. Um, now, we also want to introduce and welcome one new member of the team who just arrived and is starting this week, Scott Kennedy, who will be um, joining us starting this week to work on um, the Chinese economy, which is a terrific addition for us, and, and we're delighted to have him here. Um, I'm going to summarize uh, the points uh, from the report for you, and then in the questions, I'll let my colleagues um, elaborate on the different portions that they, that they wrote. Um, let me begin with trade, because I think most of us would agree over the coming two years, um, perhaps the most important thing the United States can do uh, to cement um, uh, our long-term engagement in the Asia-Pacific region is to complete negotiations of the Trans-Pacific Partnership um, and uh, pass uh, Trade Promotion Authority, which is constitutionally uh, critical, uh, and then TPP itself. Um, our report recommends that the President um, follow up on statements he made uh, in December to the Business Roundtable, um, uh, stating that he was ready to move forward with TPP uh, in spite of opposition from some of his own political base. 
Um, but that's got to continue and it's got to broaden. All the history of trade agreements in Washington suggests that unless you have a high level sustained case being made to the American public and to the Congress, you can't get these things done. And that has to include TPA and TPP. Um, the window is narrow. Most people think uh, that um, an agreement has to be reached, primarily with Japan. Um, I think with Japan right now, we're talking economically insignificant areas of liberalization. Uh, the, the, the tariff on auto parts in the US, pork and things like that in Japan, <clears throat> but politically um, charged. Um, and with Japan, uh, we can break through uh, and move forward with the other um, participants in the negotiations. In fact, with Japan, 95% of the TPP chapters, uh, uh, we uh, have the common uh, view that we're trying to establish 21st century views between Tokyo and Washington. Um, so this is critical, and to do that, some um, movement on trade promotion authority. we've done uh, recently um, about the Pentagon and for the Pentagon. Um, first, you know, we've argued for some time it's important for the administration to produce an East Asia strategic report. This was done by Secretary Cheney in 90 and 92. It was done by um, Secretary Perry and Secretary Cohen in 95 and 98, I believe. Um, the idea being that at, at a time of shifting uh, geostrategic dynamics, questions about U.S. resources, um, it's critical to lay out for the Congress, for the public, and for the region um, the objectives, the ends, the ways, and means of U.S. security strategy. <clears throat> the President's given speeches. The Secretaries of Defense have given speeches. Um, it, we've done a piece, Zach and I, which is in the Washington Quarterly in the current issue, which analyzes those speeches. In every speech, the priorities listed for the rebalance change. Uh, they're inconsistent. Um, and uh, Congress is a bit confused. Um, and so it's going to be important, we think, and members of Congress, leading members have asked for this, that there be a strategic uh, report clarifying uh, the priorities. In exchange, Congress has its work to do. And in particular, a uh, critical part of the military aspect of the rebalance is realigning U.S. forces, <clears throat> reducing the pressure on Okinawa, 
um, dispersing forces so they're better able to engage not just in Northeast Asia, but in Southeast Asia and in the Indian Ocean, utilizing um, access to Darwin, um, arrangements with the Philippines, um, new facilities in Guam. Much of the cost of this realignment is being borne by our friends and allies, but the U.S. has to pay for some new facilities as well, particularly in Guam. Uh, Congress hasn't fully funded those, and we think it's time to move forward to demonstrate our intent. And finally, and this is the hardest one on defense, uh, we're coming down to crunch time over the next few years. Um, we will, at the current rate of uh, defense cuts and operational demands on the U.S. military, start facing choices. Do we invest in new capabilities, what the Pentagon calls um, ACDP, Advanced Capabilities and Deterrence uh, Program? Do we invest in new capabilities to counter uh, missile threats and cyber threats, especially in the Western Pacific? Or do we sustain our traditional platforms like aircraft carrier battle groups that demonstrate American commitment and presence? The, right, the answer, the right answer is we do both, but we're getting to the point where we're going to have to choose. And that's not a, that's not a choice that will be missed uh, uh, by our allies. <clears throat> and sequestration is a large part of the problem. One way out of sequestration we recommended with respect to defense would be for the Congress to pass a non-binding budget resolution sometime in the spring that sets defense spending above sequestration caps. And the President would probably or might veto this, but it would lay the groundwork for increasing defense spending in the reconciliation process, uh, uh, which could be justified based on increased revenue uh, and by the demands on U.S. forces in the Pacific um, and the, the danger that capabilities in the Pacific will be drawn down to deal with um, increasing demands unanticipated in uh, the Middle East. <clears throat> on Korea, um, uh, you'll all want to know about um, uh, uh, the interview and hacking uh, against Sony. Uh, Victor Cha did not do it. Um, <laughs> he has written quite a bit about it, though. Um, uh, uh, the Korea piece of this argues that we have to continue enhancing uh, cyber capabilities, uh, particularly between the U.S. and ROK, as well as uh, missile defense capabilities, which is a sensitive subject in, in Korea, but one we have to move forward on. Uh, we argue that given the movement on um, condemning North Korean human rights violations, finally, in the U.N., uh, human rights should be a more central part of U.S. Uh, policy towards North Korea. Um, an area where the Congress is likely to be quite supportive. <clears throat> and this one is hard, but it is strategically imperative for the United States in the next two years to work on improving Japan-Korea relations, uh, which are strained for reasons that um, are complex and have more to do with identity and politics than geostrategy, but that definitely complicate Korea's foreign policy, our foreign policy, and Japan's foreign policy. The administration has um, signaled there will be a trilateral information sharing agreement uh, among the U.S., Japan, and Korea, but Korea has GSOMIA information sharing agreements with 25 countries, but not Japan. So this is an area that Congress can play a role and the administration needs to keep moving forward. On India, um, India is part of the overall uh, uh, fabric of the strategic uh, equilibrium in the Asia-Pacific region. Under uh, Prime Minister Modi, there's potential for change, but it is India. Uh, so how much change and how quickly is always going to be a an issue, and Rick Rosso will tell us. Um, defense is one of the most promising areas of cooperation with the new Modi government, and Rick recommended uh, ensuring that the new defense framework agreement with India uh, moves forward, um, that Ash Carter be confirmed quickly. Uh, I think across the region, uh, all of us are strong supporters of uh, Secretary Designate Carter, who knows all these issues very well. Um, Congress can do its part. The India caucus is very active, but more broadly, congressional leadership should be engaging with India. Um, on the economy, um, more economic reforms are probably coming. Uh, investment, uh, bilateral investment treaty negotiations with India need to be energized to keep a disciplined focus. And we've had coordination and strategic dialogue with the Indian government on Afghanistan and on East Asia that's been sort of on again, off again. We need to energize that, given the changes in the region. Uh, finally, Southeast Asia, an area where the administration has been very um, engaged, very active, but some challenges are ahead, um, principally uh, the um, 2015 elections uh, coming up in Myanmar or Burma. Um, more needs to be done with uh, the new leader in Jakarta, Mr. Jokowi, to institutionalize the U.S.-Indonesia Comprehensive Partnership. It's time for President Obama to go to Vietnam 
uh, an important, increasingly important uh, relationship for the U.S. strategically and economically in that region. Not easy because of uh, human rights concerns, um, TPP negotiations, but absolutely critical. It is possible to walk and chew gum at the same time. It is possible to engage strategically and address uh, concerns the Congress in particular will have uh, with respect to human rights. Um, and we need to support countries like uh, the Philippines that are pursuing legal means uh, through the arbitral tribunal to address um, China's claim uh, that the nine dash line uh, defines uh, Chinese territorial uh, rights in the South China Sea. So these are some of the areas, there are certainly more, and my colleagues can elaborate, um, where uh, we think it's practical, um, it's consistent with what Republican leaders and the White House have said they want to do, uh, and where um, the American public wants, clearly, uh, bipartisan uh, efforts to advance our interests in the region. Let me uh, open it up now for questions. My colleagues will want to weigh in and answer specifics or elaborate on some of these outlines. Um, stretching sequestration to add more money for defense. I hope you also support keeping the 50-50 re relation in the BCA, Budget Control Act, between domestic and defense. Do you have a position on that? I'll speak only for myself. Um, and uh, that is to say, Uh, between investing in capabilities to sustain deterrence in the future and engagement uh, as well. And uh, that's critical. And it's critical enough that the Congress ought to table it, the President and the Congress ought to debate it. If the answer is a 50-50 split, I don't think anybody on this panel would object to that. Hi, uh, Nadia Chow with the Liberty Time. Thank you for doing this. I have a two question. First uh, is about the Korea. Uh, I wonder, uh, do the panelists feel like China is changing its view on Korea? Uh, are there more, you know, preparation on China's side if there's a collapse of, uh, you know, North Korea, and they, they will be more willing to accommodate a possible unification future for uh, the Korean people? And the second question, uh, with the, you know, the election just concluded last November in Taiwan, um, there's many uncertainty uh, developing uh, in Taiwan. Do you feel like uh, cross-strait issues will be a new concern for the U.S.? And what do you think about you know, the medical parole of a president, former President Chen Shui-bian? Do you think there will be an implication for the domestic, domestic politics? Thanks. Thank you, Nadia, for the question. I do think that there is a potential that cross-strait relations reemerge uh, on the agenda uh, for a number of countries, including the United States. Uh, I think 2015 will be a year mostly of stagnation in cross-strait relations. The potential, I think, for re-ignited uh, uh, tensions comes really potentially after the uh, elections in January of 2016. Uh, I think that the United States will be in close consultations and should be with both of the parties in Taiwan, uh, and particularly with uh, the DPP. Uh, but there's still a lot more that can be done in this period to bolster, bolster U.S.-Taiwan relations, which I think is especially important as we 
uh, deal with this coming period of uncertainty. So more arms sales, uh, which of course Congress uh, would be involved in as well. Uh, they, uh, Taiwan, as you know, is extremely interested in and has recently announced it will be building its own submarines uh, and the United States could have a role uh, to play in that. Uh, and I think that the United States should be bolstering uh, Taiwan's continued participation in the international community. Uh, but in the run-up to this election in Taiwan, I think it's important for the United States, as I said, uh, to maintain consultations, to be talking with Beijing, uh, so that China does not overreact to the potential election of a DPP president. Uh, and uh, at the same time, I would say that the United States should remain neutral. Um, on the Korea-China question, let me just say something. I'm sure Chris will want to say something as well. My, so my sense is that um, um, so that Chinese have a lot of indigestion when it comes to North Korea. Uh, it's not an ulcer yet, but uh, it's certainly a very sour stomach, and I don't think that has changed um, uh, uh, over the past quarter, and I don't think it's going to change over the next quarter. Um, I think. The South Koreans have been quite aggressive in trying to uh, develop um, a strategic understanding with Beijing, with the Xi Jinping government on, on North Korea. It's one of the reasons that I think uh, Park Geun-hye has been so um, uh, enthusiastic about holding as many meetings, creating as many ties, NSC, NSC ties, defense exchanges, to try to, uh, try to deepen that understanding. Uh, at APEC, we saw that they announced the plans for a free trade agreement, the two, the two leaders, which again, I think is another sign that uh, Korea is trying to step into a space that they see opening up between uh, China and DPRK. Um, contrary to um, some perceptions, I don't think that the South Koreans are doing this hard push on China because of Japan, in the sense that they're angry with Japan, so they're trying to draw closer to China. That doesn't mean the Chinese don't see it that way. I'm sure the Chinese see it as an opportunity to try to pull the South Koreans out of the, uh, the three-way alliance. Um, um, and so in that sense, I think bo both Seoul and Beijing feel like they're winning at the game that they're playing. Um, whereas the reality is probably neither of them are winning, but either of them are inching a little closer to their desired objective. So. Thanks, Victor. Uh, yeah, I would agree with that. I think. As we've talked about and written about collectively with regard to China's approach to North Korea under Xi Jinping, I mean, my own view is a lot of ink has been spilt about the issue of have they changed their policy. I think we would all agree that at the fundamental level, they haven't. They're still the lifeline that keeps the North Koreans going and so on. As Victor said, there's substantial indigestion. I, I think it's actually edging more toward an ulcer at this stage. But, uh, and I think we're going to continue to see the same Chinese approach, which is to deny Kim Jong-un a visit uh, to Beijing, which is obviously very significant. I don't foresee any senior Chinese leader uh, going to North Korea either. Uh, and so the issue for me really isn't uh, about change. It's about the, the normalization of the relationship. You know, Xi Jinping has clearly sent a signal that the Sino-DPRK relations will not be a special relationship that they've been since the Korean War, but rather a normal state-to-state -state relationship under which China takes clearly the very senior role. And the message, I think, has been from the Chinese side, we are the senior partner in this relationship. You, North Korea, should, uh, you know, in a perfect world, should uh, align with our interests or at least don't make trouble for us. Uh, and Kim has clearly been uncomfortable with that sort of view. And so I think we're going to continue to see this low boil. Um, on Taiwan, uh, absolutely agree with everything Bonnie said. I think it's a, a downrange problem, but, but one that the U.S. government in particular better start focusing on because my sense is that uh, this cross-strait issue will be back on the agenda. Uh, I, I agree that we should be doing everything we can to, to calm concerns about a possible DPP victory, but at some level I don't think the Chinese are going to be able to help themselves in that regard uh, should that result come. What will be interesting is to look historically, I think it's fair to say that uh, during the Chen Shui-bian period, you know, the Chinese made a deliberate decision to kind of forego their interests in the South China Sea, or at least put it on the back burner while they focused exclusively on managing the cross-strait problem. Um, and then when President Ma came in, they were able to kind of put their head up again and look, and we've seen what they've been doing down there. Should we have another turn in cross-strait relations, it'll be interesting to see what impact that has on the South China Sea, East China Sea issues as well. 
add my purely personal view, Nadia, on President Chen. I spent many, many hours with him. Um, he is a man who suffered, and his family suffered a lot in the process of democratization. And I think, speaking for myself, he's a man who suffered enough for what he did wrong uh, during his time in the presidency. <clears throat> and in the interest of democracy in Taiwan, I think it's important um, for um, uh, a new era uh, where um, changes of government through the democratic process are not followed by vin vindictive actions. And, um, you know, the president was uh, found guilty under due process. I'm not saying that it wasn't due process, but I think there's something useful in um, a magnanimous or forgiving view after a certain period of, um, of p paying uh, the debt back to society for Taiwan's long-term democracy. That's my own view. <clears throat> um, on the election, um, I think it will be important for the administration uh, to be very disciplined. Uh, I personally was disappointed to read the Financial Times story during the last uh, presidential election, which appeared to be um, an administration uh, uh, hit uh, uh, against uh, Tsai Ing-wen. <clears throat> um, it may not have been, but um, I think it will be very important going forward to um, put as a first and foremost priority for U.S. policy um, respect for Taiwan's democratic process. Um, and there are ways to signal um, expectations with respect to cross-state relations and relations between Washington and Taipei, <clears throat> some private, maybe some public, but I think the administration has to be more careful and more disciplined than it was last time. That's not easy. Taiwan's uh, democratic politics are not for the faint of heart. Um, there's lots of, um, uh, well, I was gonna say there's lots of stuff flying in the air, and literally there's lots of stuff flying in the air in the LOI, <clears throat> and in the Congress, there are strong views about, um, about Taiwan in different quarters, but I think the administration's gotta be really very, very disciplined this time. Uh, it's important uh, for um, our overall stance uh, in the region. Where are microphone experts? Andrew, oh, there we go. Hi, Russ Deming at SICE. <clears throat> First of all, thank you very much for this report. Very useful to try to maintain a bipartisan approach to, to Asia. My question is on Japan. There's no really pers detailed treatment of the U.S.-Japan relationship. We, Abe now has a three-year mandate, which raises risks and opportunities. Um, we have um, the basing issues in Okinawa become more complicated with Okinawan politics, and we're now in the 70th anniversary year of the Second World War which raises history issues as a, as a problematic thing. I wonder what, what your thoughts are on <clears throat> managing U.S.-Japan relations over the next few years. Thanks. Um, Matt, Matt has graciously asked me to do the history question, <laughs> and he'll address things that uh, involve numbers. <clears throat> um, although history does involve numbers, of course, because as you said, it's the 70th anniversary. It's an anniversary of many other things, the 21 demands and so on. Um, I took some encouragement from Prime Minister Abe's New Year's uh, address on this issue where he um, said what I believe was the case all along, that he will keep the previous apologies uh, by uh, then Chief Cabinet Secretary Kono, former Prime Minister Moriyama, and at his own um, statement of remorse. The model that I hear about you probably too as well, Rusty, is the Canberra speech, which everyone should read if you're interested in Japan, because it was a really very uh, emotional and forthcoming um, uh, disposition by Prime Minister Abe before the Australian Parliament on, on what Japan did to Australia and the Kokoda Trail and elsewhere. Very emotional, very important for US-Australia, excuse me, for Japan-Australia diplomatic and strategic ties. And I think um, a lesson that people around the Prime Minister and the Prime Minister himself are taking away as they think about the 70th anniversary. Um, Okinawa is going to be harder uh, after the um, gubernatorial election. I'm personally not convinced the new governor wants this to be the defining issue um, for a prefecture that has some, some economic challenges, um, but it's, it's going to be harder. Um, that is one of the reasons why I think it's important for the U.S. Congress to begin funding some of the um, military construction in Guam and elsewhere to show we're serious about lightening the burden on the Okinawan people and, and uh, aligning our forces more geographically and politically in a sustainable way. Well, obviously this is a report with recommendations for the U.S. Um, side of this story, um, 
but as the economics guy, it's hard not to say from a Japanese perspective, I think the most important thing they could do, I mean, the thing which Abe could do that would have the greatest return on investment would be to get the Trans-Pacific Partnership done. And that means, you know, agreeing to, um, as Mike said, we're very close on the substance. The U.S. and Japan need to reach an agreement on these final details. Uh, this would, I think, more than any other thing Abe is trying to do, certainly in the economic sphere, uh, would, um, would have a very powerful impact on Japan's economic prospects, on its strategic position, and I think on U.S.-Japan relations, which brings it back here. I think that this is the thing the U.S. Um, should be, in the near term, most focused on because it's the, it's the, the iron that is hottest in, in the fire right now, that, that we could uh, strike a deal very quickly. Um, I think the negotiators are going to re-engage re uh, later this month, and I very much hope uh, and don't see why they shouldn't be able to reach an agreement. And if Abe is serious about uh, e economics being at the center of his, uh, his agenda, and if um, President Obama is serious about TPP being uh, a critical part of his legacy, then, then I would very much hope and, and even expect that they will reach agreement in the first uh, part of this year. Just to add on what Matt said briefly, I think the magic bullet, so to speak, <clears throat> will be um, uh, when, uh, you know, until now, every free trade agreement we've done, as Scott has, has, has um, explained, um, has been preceded by trade promotion authority, um, and uh, with one small exception, uh, with Jordan, uh, right after 9-11, which is really not, um, you know, a really unique case. The, the administration has decided this time to sort of move TPA and TPP more or less in parallel um, presumably with TPA at some point coming first. It's asking a lot of our trade partners to trust us on TPA uh, and give their best deal. It's asking an awful lot. There aren't many big issues left, frankly, in the U.S.-Japan relationships, but the ones that are there are stuck over this issue in a way, politically in Japan. <clears throat> um, my sense of the magic bullet would be that um, the President's initial um, volley uh, in early December with the business roundtable about his commitment to getting TPA done is followed up with more engagement. And um, in Tokyo, they hear this not just from the administration, they start hearing it from the Republican leadership in Congress. And when they start hearing from uh, the Republican Congress, we can get this done, uh, then I think the negotiations bilaterally will be much, much um, uh, easier. Um, so that's why uh, Scott and Matt emphasized in this report how important it is for a sustained high-level campaign, not just a one-off speech, but a real sustained campaign on TPP and TPA um, with the American public, um, with key uh, interest groups, and especially with the leadership in Congress. In the way back with the red dress. Yeah. Uh, thank you, reporter from The Voice of America. And I have two questions concerning China. And I'm reading an article which say that China is having a big diplomacy shift. And uh, China also giving priority to, uh, to its neighboring countries. So uh, my question is, how it's going to affect US pivot to Asia? Because people say that when China, China is now also pivot to Asia. The second question is about Chinese uh, Vice Premier Wang Yang's comments, recent comment. He's saying that China, uh, I couldn't remember the exact words, but it's like to the effect that U.S. is the leader, still the leader of the world. So what's your interpretation here? Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, I, uh, the, you know, big diplomatic shift uh, in Chinese foreign policy, I think, was really evident in President Xi Jinping's recent speech to the so-called Central Foreign Affairs Work Conference that took place a couple of weeks back now. Um, and in that speech, and I think the subsequent things we've seen, it really is a reaffirmation of this notion that under his leadership, China is, has decided to take uh, a much more forward-leaning approach to its foreign policy, a much more multi-directional foreign policy. And it was interesting uh, in the speech that in terms of the batting order of prioritization, he did choose to put what they call peripheral diplomacy or neighbor diplomacy ahead of major country relations, thus being uh, U.S.-China relations. Uh, we've spoken to, both Bonnie and I have spoken to a lot of Chinese interlocutors who all say, it, no, it's not a shift and, and so on, but these things get done deliberately generally in, inside their system. So I think what it means, you know, and we mentioned this in the report, 
uh, for our own administration and Congress is that this is a very dedicated effort that's, that's being undertaken. She, in the speech, talks a lot about building Chinese soft power, talks a lot about using their economic leverage in the region. Uh, and we need to be aware that this is happening. I think that the administration has been slow uh, to acknowledge this shift uh, and to see that it is a, a major change, really, in the way they approach things. Um, and so we, I think, collectively would like to see them acknowledge that more strongly and think about how we're going to respond. And it doesn't mean that we have to respond in some kind of zero-sum or tit-for-tat manner. In fact, we would argue that's not what we want to see, and that's why we so strongly recommend in the report uh, pursuing things like the Bilateral Investment Treaty, trying to deepen our relationships with these people who are advising Xi Jinping uh, on these major issues. You know, he has substantially changed the method of advisory inside the system as well now, those formal organs like the foreign ministry and so on don't play the role that they did under the previous administration. So thinking full uh, scope about how we take this into account in our own policy is going to be critical. On Wang Yang's comments, I, I saw it, didn't see anything particularly new there. I mean, they've, they've frequently reaffirmed this uh, sort of position. It is interesting that someone at his level chose to do so, uh, but I didn't find it surprising. Let me just add a couple of things uh, to uh, Chris's uh, remarks. I think that the recent uh, Central Work Conference on uh, uh, Chinese foreign policy um, is very important because it does signal uh, a number of things, certainly more uh, proactive Chinese foreign policy and uh, the uh, Xi Jinping uh, claiming, of course, that now China is going to have a great power, or though major country is the same characters, but really means great power uh, foreign policy with uh, special characteristics. Uh, but the question remains, I think, as to whether putting the periphery at the top uh, really means a recognition of deterioration of China's relations with the neighborhood and therefore leading to an adjustment in Chinese foreign policy going forward. If that is the case, then what is that adjustment? What we're seeing so far is uh, China's emphasis on economic integration and trying to give the neighbors economic incentives uh, to connect them through the 21st century maritime Silk Road uh, and uh, the, uh, the economic, the um, uh, uh, traditional uh, economic Silk Road, uh, to try to bind them more to China's uh, own development and in turn to assist China's development. Uh, this is not just about giving, it's about getting. This is what China means by a win-win uh, approach. So I think the jury's still out as to whether or not we are going to see a reduction in some of China's more provocative policies, particularly in the territorial disputes. And I think that's really the nub. That's what the United States, I think, is particularly concerned about. We certainly don't want to see continued intimidation of, uh, of China's neighbors. And on Wang Yang's point, uh, I would agree with Chris that it has been uh, said before that the, uh, China doesn't want to push the United States out of the region. But it is important, I think, at this particular juncture for a leader at that level to be saying not only that the U.S. remains the main core superpower in the world, but that China wants to integrate itself into the prevailing international system. Now, the devil is in the details. As Mike talked about earlier, the Asian uh, Infrastructure Investment Bank is going to be a critical test of whether or not China really is going to adopt the rules and norms that have been developed over the course of many years by major international donors. Uh, but I think that the statement itself is important, and we should be watching China's behavior. Here. Bernard Gordon University of New Hampshire. I want to return to TPP, both on the Japan side uh, and uh, with regard to China. Um, you, Matt, and Mike are very optimistic in, ter or, uh, in terms of what is needed for the United States, but there is some talk in Tokyo that the uh, Prime Minister can't go forward until the upper house elections later this spring. For, is your view that that is realistic, or is that more of a block than, uh, than, is, uh, than is realistic to be thinking about? Secondly, in terms of China, a year ago at this time, uh, there was much consideration in Beijing about possibly joining TPP. Governor Huntsman has re resurrected that issue, as have others. 
Uh, could both of you speak to that point, uh, the China side, and on the whether in Japan there is as much concern on TPP as we say there needs to be? Thanks. Um, well, I can start, and, and I'm sure others will have, have views, Scott and, uh, and Chris. Um, so there's always another election in Japan. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't think that that should be, and I don't think it is, um, an obstacle to um, uh, Japan and, and Prime Minister Abe moving forward. Um, as I say, they're close. Uh, they could, with a little bit of political capital uh, on his side, and, and I do think in the scheme of things, it's not a huge amount of political capital that Prime Minister Abe has to invest in this decision in the scheme of things. Um, you know, he could get this done. And yeah, there'll be another election. But remember, he made the decision to join TPP ahead of an upper house election um, and against the odds. And, and that required quite a bit of political capital. Uh, so I, I actually think with this new mandate and with his having focused on economics as the right course, uh, the only course uh, for Japan, I think that, that uh, the iron is hot and, and uh, it's time to strike. Uh, and, and by the way, just since I now have a chance to say, just to affirm what Mike said, I, certainly on this end, uh, we need to do more and the President personally needs to do more to show, uh, to continue to show uh, that we're willing to move forward on uh, trade promotion authority and, and get our end of the bargain done. Um, but Abe holds a lot of the cards there. And on China, I'll just offer my two cents, which is that um, eventually the TPP uh, strategy is to pull China into uh, the uh, rules-based system in, in Asia, and TPP is the vehicle for doing that. Uh, I think when Japan joined TPP last year, sorry, now the year before, um, it really sent a message to Beijing and that you saw the, the conversation in Beijing change. Whether they're ready to join TPP, qua TPP in the short term, uh, not clear to me, but I think they certainly got their attention and I think they understand uh, and probably agree that they need to be part of this, uh, this system of, of rules that's being negotiated in TPP. So I would expect eventually they will join something in the region that is a, uh, I, I think, based on a TPP agreement uh, going forward, it may be called something different. I would agree with Matt <clears throat> that uh, in a 12-party negotiation like TPP, somebody's always holding an election. So <laughs> these things happen. <clears throat> More importantly, I think we have our own work to do here. <clears throat> Everyone, since the election, all the leaders, uh, the president, uh, incoming Majority Leader McConnell, Speaker Boehner, uh, Chairman, new, new Chairman Hatch, all the leaders have said the right things. What matters now is what they do, all right? And uh, it's a fairly tricky process, particularly the president uh, uh, will need to manage his own party's politics of trade, which are, which are complicated and difficult. It, it certainly can be done. Uh, I would look, uh, the model is the Trade Act of 1988, uh, which took about five months start to finish. And once again, there you had, a, you had divided government. You had a uh, Republican president in the last year of, 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 of his term and, uh, and uh, Democratic Congress. So these things can be done. It's gonna take time and we really need to, to see that action happen and the behaviors to change. The second question about uh, China joining TPP, uh, like, like Matt, I, I'm, I don't know whether they will join TPP as it exists or whether there will be something else. But at, I noticed at APEC meetings, an interesting conversation began at the Chinese initiative uh, of, of discussing what, what, is the, what is the sort of the, the, the future of Asia Pacific trade after the completion of the RCEP agreement, which China is a party and the United States is not, and the completion of TPP where the US is a party and China is not. So constructive discussions, that's certainly, from a commercial standpoint, pretty obvious, but uh, I would note the genuine interest uh, on the part of the Chinese. Right up here in front. Thank, thank you. I'm Paul Cadario from the University of Toronto. I'd be interested in the team's um, reflections or reactions to the question of wild cards, things you haven't thought of that might come from outside the region or not in the United States. Let me just suggest three. Uh, the president will need to decide on Keystone. If he decides no, then that creates energy issues for Canada and where they might export to, which might suit uh, the Chinese very nicely. Um, but in a year of election in Canada, that creates an issue for United America's closest ally. Um, second issue, uh, 
Uh, and then, of course, the climate talks relate to energy. Where does China get its energy? Paris, U.S. and China making a deal that might put some pressure on India, for example, and Australia. Um, second issue is a broad area of cyber. Um, in a situation where there was something um, a little more um, important from an intellectual property point of view than movie scripts and ind indiscreet emails, or even created um, a physical attack um, traceable somewhere, uh, what happens? Because clearly there are various people and there are discussions about how the internet should be governed, which India and China seem to be sort of redefining multi-stakeholderism. Um, third issue is um, problems outside the region, uh, like from the Middle East and Europe, where there are issues about Asia's energy supply, if there's further turbulence in the Middle East, or uh, if Russia starts to get aggressive and creates problems where the world is sort of figuring out what to do with Russia and China and India might not agree. Just, I'm just suggesting those three. There may be others that you've thought of or you're going to write about. Thank you. While my colleagues think about this, let me um, make a sh use your question to make a shameless plug. <laughs> we, uh, every January, the last few Januaries, uh, we've all gathered here to do uh, uh, an exercise we call uh, Asia Forecasting. Um, and uh, we're scheduling that for January 29th. You're all welcome to join us. The way we do it is we arm the audience with clickers, um, and it's basically the panel versus the audience uh, predicting <laughs> what will happen in 2015. Nobody, nobody wins or loses because it's only January. <laughs> um, and uh, this year we'll have two uh, groups. We'll split ourselves into two groups. <clears throat> and one uh, group will um, look at geostrategy, but especially alignments. Uh, what will happen to the Sino-Russian alignment? What will happen to Japan-Korea, uh, U.S.-India, and so forth? And we'll start, you know, making predictions for 2015 about the chessboard in Asia. Um, and then a second panel will start um, uh, predicting or, 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 or uh, handicapping the prospects for economic reform in Modi's India, in, uh, in Japan, and so forth and in China, of, of course, and you're all welcome to join, and we put the questions up, we ask the audience, we debate what we think. You gave me a good idea, we, we may want to add a wild card uh, session. I'm not sure, we'll have to find a technological way for people to put their wild cards up so we can comment on them, uh, but please join us on the 29th. Now, in terms of wild cards, um, North Korea is always a big one, um, especially uh, since they're probably prepared for another nuclear test. Um, and don't let crises go without a chance to escalate them. <clears throat> um, I think you're right to mention the Middle East, which will exacerbate the problem I mentioned about resources in the Asia Pacific. It's not just about investing in platforms and new technologies. It's about where the carrier battle group and the Marines spend their time, because the Pacific Command's area of responsibility stretches uh, to Southwest Asia. Um, so these could all affect um, Asia. And, and then historically, the last two years of administrations on Asia are not often very good. Um, George Herbert Walker Bush, um, some of you will recall, had a pretty um, unfortunate visit to Japan. Uh, and his, uh, yeah, there's some people may have been on the trip. Um, it culminated in him, in, vomiting, in him vomiting on the Chinese Prime Minister. Um, uh, uh, Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton in his last two years um, had the famous uh, Japan passing where he traveled to China, um, you know, really um, unsettled US-Japan relations. And frankly, the, the George W. Bush administration had, uh, you know, a, a, a groping for a deal with North Korea that completely fell apart and left real questions uh, among uh, many in the region. In all three cases, um, the problem was political bandwidth at home. Um, you know, when, the, when, when you're in your final years, it's pretty, it's pretty tired. A lot of the strategic heavyweights who started the administration are gone. Some talented people come in, but <clears throat> you spend a lot more time dealing with the race uh, to succeed you. Um, so these wild cards could have an even bigger impact in the last two years of an administration and are worth, uh, are worth uh, pointing to. I feel better enough so that we can hear a few more. Yeah, I'll touch on a couple that uh, so, some of which weren't directly talked about in the report, but South Asia related. So uh, you mentioned about energy and uh, oil prices uh, spiraling down for the U.S.-India relationship could play in a couple of ways. For one, if India's import bill uh, drops dramatically, as would be expected, um, the import bill is part of the reason they put up a lot of uh, trade measures that have actually impaired U.S.-India trade relations in the last couple of years. 
So there might be reduced pressure in Delhi to actually put up some of the trade barriers to slow down their import bill. So that would be good for U.S.-India relations. But on the downside, it also means that, you know, the impetus behind economic reforms in India, which Modi, you know, partially uh, was, was elected on, uh, could be reduced somewhat if that helps to repair the economy. Um, for South Asia, of course, you've got two others which are closely related. One is, you know, the U.S. changing presence in Afghanistan. And if that, res if, if not even as a result of that, but if you see an increase in terror attacks on India, the perception in Delhi right now is that America reduced presence in Afghanistan will free up the hand of terrorist organizations to play a bigger role, including cross-border to India. So whether it's directly related or not, there's going to be a perception that America's reduced role in Afghanistan contribute to that. So we did talk about, you know, we need to collaborate more closely with India on Afghanistan. We've got a trilateral, but it hasn't been meeting as often as it should. Um, the, the last wild card I'll say in South Asia is Pakistan, which, you know, the, the Pakistan military, and I just did a, a lecture tour across India, and they continue to press on, you know, why does America continue to support the government of Pakistan? And I point out that, you know, stating back six months or longer, you know, the Pakistan military has had a successful, sustained military campaign against insurgents on its own territory. And that has only escalated since the, the horrific attack recently in Pakistan against the school children. So in U.S.-India relations, it's a strange lens, right? If Pakistan continues and is successful in its own domestic war on terror, the United States would certainly want to help to support that, which by its nature would actually push us a little bit away from India. So Afghanistan and Pakistan are a couple of wild, I mean, Af and Afghanistan, I don't think anybody would call it a wild card since it's clearly one of the biggest issues in American foreign policy this year, but Pakistan's another one. So a few on my, my, my plate. Hey, Ernie, um, since there are never any wild cards in Southeast Asia. Um, <laughs> Every day is just boring and we, you know, we always know exactly what to expect. Thailand. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, I think Southeast Asia will surprise us this year. Um, I, I would look to Thailand. Um, there, Thailand is a, a powder keg, I think, uh, politically. Um, the the, the uh, coup government, uh, the military government, has um, said that they can't do elections this year as they had hoped to do, and they probably will do them in 2016. I personally believe they won't uh, do those until um, uh, other uh, events that uh, we could talk about probably not on on TV uh, happen, but I think uh, I think the ties are um, are getting fed up. The economy is not performing at the level it should, and and when the business uh, community turns against uh, the the government or starts to have worries about it, I think we should be watching for uh, some uh, political developments in Thailand. The other thing that will surprise us in Southeast Asia is Jokowi and uh, the new president of Indonesia, I think, is going to assert himself much more seriously in uh, foreign affairs and in security uh, issues than we thought. And, uh, and I think um, uh, that will have an impact on Southeast Asia and, and ASEAN. And the last one is the uh, arbitrational, uh, or ar arbitration uh, tribunal, uh, the decision will probably come out, it could come out this year, maybe uh, early 2016. And, um, you know, I think the way China reacts to that decision and the way the ASEAN countries uh, respond to it uh, will be something that we should not be, we, we should try not to be surprised by. And that's why we, we flagged this in the report. It's something the American foreign policy should be all over and we should be working the traps uh, in, in capitals throughout the Indo-Pacific uh, getting prepared for that, so we're not surprised by the decision. I ask you need to also say something about um, Burma policy, which historically has been not partisan, but highly divisive. Um, and when Dal Aung San Suu Kyi came here, she had good meetings with the president, good meetings with um, Senator McConnell, who's been committed on democracy and human rights in Burma. Um, is that bipartisanship and uh, sort of cross um, uh, uh, governmental um, consensus that's held around the new approach uh, to Myanmar. Is that in, in jeopardy this year? This year? The, the answer is I don't know. Uh, the, you know, the, the top, uh, as you mentioned, the top, uh, the, the most interested guy on the Hill uh, is now the, uh, the leader of the Senate, um, Senator McConnell. He's been, uh, he's been a close uh, follower of uh, developments in Myanmar, and he has a, a very firm point of view. Um, we've also noticed over the last uh, I guess the last six months of last year, that as Myanmar, um, you know, sort of 
and this isn't surprising if we watch, you know, Southeast Asian history, uh, when, when reform movements get announced and start to move forward, uh, they also, uh, the, the governing uh, body can also start to pull back. This is the one step forward, two steps back dance that we've seen in many places. I think we've seen that in Myanmar, and, and Republicans in particular, but I, I'd say it's bipartisan on the Hill, have, have expressed real concerns about this, particularly around the 2015 elections. And I think there's, a, there's been a sort of an accelerating expectation that, that we're concerned about on the Hill, that if these elections take place without Aung San Suu Kyi being able to run in them, that we might have to take action against Myanmar. Um, that really um, puts a lot of risk on the table in terms of uh, the Obama administration's foreign policy plans because um, part of what I think the Obama administration would probably say they felt good about it in accomplishing is moving forward with engagement with ASEAN. And one of the key ingredients of that being able to move forward is to be able to, able to sit down with all 10 ASEAN leaders, all 10 foreign ministers, et cetera. And that was predicated on normalizing, or, or not normalizing, but opening relations with, uh, with Myanmar. So, Mike, I think, um, I, I'm not sure it's bipartisan. I, I think the administration actually has, been, has played a very responsible uh, role here. Uh, our ambassador in, uh, in Rangoon is a former CSISer, so he's obviously got his act together, <laughs> Derek Mitchell. Um, hey, Derek. Um, uh, but I think, uh, I, think, I think the administration is, really needs to work hard on the Hill to make sure that they're not um, uh, sort of unrealistic uh, expectations, but that we do have a very nuanced and, and um, effective uh, advocacy for human rights and democracy in Myanmar, because if we don't lead with those points, we'll lose a lot of ground uh, in Asia. And, and I, I'll just make one point here that I think is important. If you look at trends that I think are really important in Asia, across Asia, Southeast Asia is a leading trend for the assertion of a growing middle class, a middle class that's going to grow from about 500 million uh, people today, today to 3.2 billion across the Indo-Pacific by 2025. And that middle class, we can see them sort of uh, uh, putting their issues forward in Southeast Asia. Uh, and they're doing that through elections, which is very positive. Um, but they are challenging incumbents, and they're challenging um, uh, the role of traditional uh, sort of centrally controlled governments. They're asking for more transparency, more involvement in, uh, in um, governance. And I think this is a, kind of a trend that will affect all of Asia uh, over time. Well, thank you all for coming. We're looking at two years where um, relations across the Pacific are hitting some, some really critical turning points on TPP, on the Korean Peninsula, um, with our allies, with China, um, precisely when Washington is entering into what will probably be one of the most um, uh, divisive and contested periods in our recent political history. So we're making an appeal. We hope you all agree. And if not with every piece of this report, with the idea that we should be um, uh, working together to try to keep our interests in Asia, our success over several administrations moving forward. If you look at all the elements we're talking about in these policies, very few began with President Obama, very few began with President Bush, a lot of them go back to Clinton. Uh, there's an awful lot of continuity here and an awful lot of investment by both parties. Um, and we're hoping that people will keep that history in mind and uh, our interests uh, moving forward um, together. Um, thank you all, have a happy new year, and we hope, uh, we hope we'll see you on the 29th. Thanks.